We're looking in these scriptures and why did God put acts on our heart for this particular season is that we're looking into these to say, God, this was a transformational community. What does it look like for us to be a transformational community? As we look at them and how they led, how they followed, what they did, we want to learn from that. And we want to be people, as we have said throughout this series, we want to be people who are transformed, but not just transformed. We want to be people who carry transformation. And so we know that the pandemic or the response to the pandemic, depending on how you look at this, it has derailed lives, it has disrupted community, and we're on the other side of that, I believe, and we have to ask ourselves, how do we reclaim some of that lost territory? How do we reclaim some of that lost community? How do we reclaim some of the things that were stolen from people or taken from people? And I believe that's by being a transformational community that carries transformation. We have to ask ourselves as we recover from 2020, from 2021, what do we want to return to? What do we want to leave behind? What do we want to be formed or reformed around? And then what is the impact that God has for us to take to this community that we are a part of? And we get this, that to a degree, this is our faith community and it is for us, right? Living Waters and Sunday morning, it is for us. But we don't stop at the for us. We want to say, what does it look like to go into all the world? What does it look like to carry this truth and the the life of Jesus and the impact and the transformation he's had in us individually and as a community? How do we carry that forward? So I would say it like this, and I know it's a cheesy little saying, but we gather to grow. Like the places that we, and it's not the only way, we grow. Don't hear me say that. But one of the reasons that we gather is to grow in our connection to Jesus. It is we gather to grow in our connection to those around us. We get together as a community so that we can grow together, but we also have to gather to go. So we gather gather to grow, but we also gather to go. Cheesy saying, I know, but it'll stick in your head. And you'll be like, I don't remember anything Ryan said on that one Sunday morning, but that lame saying, we gather to grow, we gather to go. Where are we going? What are we doing? And so this is why I shared with you a little while while ago, we have Community Life Sundays coming up. The last Sunday of every month for the rest of this year, we're not going to have corporate gatherings like this. We're going to we're going to be going out into our community together. We're going to be going out with our community groups. We're going to be making that, those Sundays a time where we are not highlighting the corporate gathering. We're highlighting the corporate going. And so we will come here and we'll meet up here for some of us. I mean, you might be meeting with your community group in other places. But what we what we are envisioning is a chance to come together here and maybe we'll meet up in the in the relief warehouse maybe we'll meet up at the tent out there or wherever it might be but we'll come together and then we'll we'll have a, a community outreach that we get to be a part of so this community life sunday starting july 31st at 10 o'clock this will be either a sunday for your community group to get together it'll be a community outreach day for our church we'll have projects already cooked up for you um could be to serve, it could be adopt a block, it could be prayer walk. Um, I believe that this coming Sunday, uh, July 31st, one of the ones that, not this coming Sunday, but the Sunday, the Community Life Sunday, July 31st, one of the things we're going to be doing is Rogue Love. Some of you have been a part of that. We're going to meet here and we're going to walk around our block and then we're going to walk around the city and the extended blocks and 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 pick up trash and just pray for our city. Um, and so things like that, we're going to be meeting here so that we can go out and do those things with our with our families and with our community groups. And we're coming up with things that fit all ages for adults, for kids uh, to be together. We want this to be something where we're not like, oh yeah, we'll drop our kids off in Sunday school and we're gonna go do serving projects. Like we envision our kids and everybody going out there and being a part of this for no matter what their age is, they can help and learn to serve and say, my faith, it helps me grow, but my faith also compels me by the love of Christ to go and to make a difference in my city. And then we will have what we're calling the community table. It'll be here this, in, this, in this building somewhere at 10 o'clock. Um, maybe there's people who are coming on a Sunday and they're expecting a corporate gathering, or maybe there's people who aren't a part of a community group or they, they don't wanna do the service project, but they really wanna connect relationally. We're just gonna have a meal together, set up a big table, have a meal. Whoever wants to come, we'll, we'll have some of our community groups will be hosting that meal and, uh, and just being with people and building relationship with people and maybe there'll be a a sort of an unplugged like we'll do a little bit of maybe a song or we'll share a little bit about God's heart Um, but really it's a place for people to connect with one another within community around a meal breaking bread together 
together. Do this whenever, whenever you break bread together. Do this in remembrance of me. So that's why we're calling it a community table, a communion table for us to just give a place for people to come. I mean, there may be people new to the church. They might be visiting that day and they're like, uh, hand them a trash bag and say, go pick up trash. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know if that's going to work, but, but maybe, they, maybe a good place is to come is to be at, at a table with people and sharing a meal together. And so we invite you to be a part of this and, and we'll keep telling you about this and we'll have more information, but I wanted to remind you that this is part of our going. This is part of our response in acts of saying, wait, when you transformed people, they went into their lives and they carried that transformation. And so the heart of our church is asking the question, do we need to highlight the corporate gathering so much that we're not doing some of the things? And what if, I know people have a heart to do all these things, but time is always there's, a, there's just that struggle for time. Okay, well, where do people have time in their weekly schedule, traditionally and culturally? Where have you created time? Always, Sunday morning. So what if instead of taking that time to meet and me to talk at you some more, we said, wait, we already have the time set aside. We know that God wants us to be people who go out into our community. Why don't we just do it at that time that is already set aside for people, right? So this is the heart of what, what we're trying to do. Um, I often think of it this way. Would the neighborhood around us notice or be impacted negatively if we ceased to exist as a church at this location? Would the marketplaces of this city notice or be impacted negatively if we ceased to exist as a church? Beyond Sunday, which I love and I believe is so vital, I am not saying that Sundays and gathering corporately is not vital, but what we do corporately and how do we bring an impact into, how do we allow that to bring an impact into our community? If we just poof and cease to exist, would Liberty Park notice? Would the downtown area notice? I want to be a church. I desperately want to be a church that is known for our worship times and, and our teaching and, our, and the community that we have. But I also want to be known as a church that carries that impact out into the city around us in a way that if we stopped being, if we were stopped being here, that people would absolutely notice. And I don't say this as a judgment against ourselves or shame upon ourselves, but I often wonder as churches are all around the city and I'm not throwing stones, I'm just saying, I'm, I'm wondering if we are carrying the kind of impact that the culture around us would notice if we weren't around. And so that's our challenge. That's our challenge. Not our judgment towards anybody else. That's our challenge to respond to. If Jesus is the heart of the church, the heart of living waters, which he absolutely is. I believe that these corporate gatherings, these community gatherings that we have, are, are the essence and our goal in these times is to capture the heartbeat of Jesus. And then we walk out carrying that heartbeat in, that, in rhythm with his heartbeat. We walk that out into the streets and into the marketplaces that we go into. And when we have that heartbeat, we allow his life to change, transform our lives, our families, the relationships, our schools, and our marketplaces. And that's what we say. When we say marketplace, when I say marketplace from the front, I'm talking about your school. I'm talking about your family. I'm talking about your job. I'm talking about all those places. It's the marketplace of your life that we are carrying Christ, his life, and his love into those marketplaces. And that unforced rhythm of grace, which we'll talk about a little bit at the end. So this is a building with a purpose. And you guys know that I talked about that a couple weeks ago, a little bit more about, hey, it's time to be, continue renovating this building and doing the work that God is calling us to do in this building. But we are not gonna renovate this building so that we can have greater gatherings. We will always have great gatherings no matter where you put us. You put us in the parking lot, in the heat of the sun, we'll have great gatherings. Put us in a tent, we'll have great gatherings. Put us in that, that building over that room over there where it's just, you can't hear a dang thing, we'll have great gatherings. Put us in here, like it doesn't matter. We can do that. You put, put Jesus at the center and you go for it. Like he's going to show up and he's going to move. And like, I want to have these great gatherings in this building, but I also, we, we really want this building to be a place of impact. And so as we renovate, as we pour resources into this, as we ask you to give into it, I want you to know that we're not trying to create this rad Sunday morning building. We're trying to create an every day of the week building that can be useful for his purposes and for his kingdom. Um, and then on the weekends, we get, to, we get to have some of the overflow of that, of having a great place to call home. Um, 
So this building, is, is, it has a purpose for us to grow together here, but also to go. And we believe that this building is a gift from God to us, but also a gift to, from God to our city. And I don't say that, and I know you're like delusions of grandeur, right? Like, okay, be a little bit more narcissistic. Like, this is, God, we're a gift to God, or a gift from God to our city, this building is. But, but it's not that pride that's speaking that. It's that miracle of how he brought us to this place for a purpose in a distinct location. And so we are stewards that miracle. And so as we're, if we ask you to give your time, your energy, your, your, your sweat, or, uh, your, your money towards this building, we are stewarding a miracle. And we're not going to turn the goal of our community into raising millions and millions of dollars to make a really fancy place, um, but to raise the money and the resources that we need to have this be a useful place for God and for his kingdom. And so we will ask you to give into that, to spread the good news, to be a powerful beacon in the heart of our city. And that's just some of the prophetic words that were spoken over this place when we prayed, uh, prayed over this place and, and believed what God is doing here. And speaking of, uh, of giving, there's, there's one thing that I want to share with you. And I'm gonna talk about finances for just a second. So if you, um, and I mean this seriously, if, you're, if you've got a kind of like, man, I've been in church, I've heard the financial talks, I've, I've been hit over the head with the financial talks and you need to sort of give yourself a second to invite peace. I'm going to talk about money. I'm going to talk about giving for, for a couple minutes. And healthy families talk about finances. One of the things that we talk about with couples and with families when, when Kate and I do that and when we're coaching is, do you talk about finances? And, and often they're like, no, and why not? Well, when I was a kid, my parents always fought about it or the divorce that I experienced as a child from my family, I think it was because of finances. And, and so what, we are, what we're challenging people to do is just to reclaim health in the area of finances. And one of the healthiest things we can do is speak about finances openly plainly, not, not the shell game with finances and excuses, but really saying this is what we have, this is where we're at, this is where we're going. If we can talk about finances, it's such a healthy indicator for the safety of that relationship and the ability to do that and not to be something that avoids you. Avoid finances and you're going to find out that they're draining out all over the place. But if you will speak about them and talk to them, talk about them, you will see that you have a better opportunity to direct them for purpose. Um, and so I want to talk about finances for just a second. Um, Briefly, but I need to invite you guys to give and just partner with us. Is one of the things that we recognize in the book of Acts is that we see early on that this transformational community in the book of Acts, they were moved to radical generosity. Um, I want to say thank you first to everybody in this community that supports Living Waters financially and, the, and what you give, and it, and it makes such a difference, and we appreciate it so deeply. Um, I met with, my, with our leadership council the other night. Our leadership council, is, we've introduced you to them. They're on our website. We talk about them often, but it's a group of leaders in the house that just represents the congregation, represents the giving, uh, and we meet with Kate and I and our team uh, to be able to talk about finances and steward those resources for kingdom purposes and make sure that we're aligned our heart. Uh, what we're doing is aligning with the vision and the heart of the church. And so I met with the leadership council the other night, and this isn't something new, but we looked over the finances at the half year mark. And, um, and, our, and, and really, here's the, here's the bottom line. We're operating at about a five or $6,000 deficit a month to exist as a church. Um, and so we've had to pull about 35,000, maybe 40, 30, close to $40,000 um, out of savings to keep living waters functional. Uh, which is paying our incredible team, paying our fixed expenses like utilities, um, having some form of ministry budget for our teams like youth and kids and worship and men's and women's stuff and production team and, uh, and so on. And so um, this is not a surprise to me. Uh, and so I, I wanted to share it with you. It's not like I just got there and they said, well, that's, I can't say that. It kind of did happen, but it wasn't. Uh, <clears throat> we'll, we'll talk about that another time. Um, it's not a surprise because the last couple of years have been very tough. And the last couple of years have been challenging for us as a church. The last couple of years have been challenging for people individually. The last couple of years, we've seen our church decrease by about 60%. Um, we have seen giving going down. That's part of the reality of what I want to talk to you guys about this morning from Acts 19. Um, and as for whatever reason, as things have shifted, as people have shifted, as things, decisions have been made, uh, it's not, I'm not shocked to find out that financially we're in a, a rough spot. But what's the solution to a rough spot? Let me, let me talk a few, a, about a few things with you guys. Because if, if I share this with you, you're probably asking yourself, um, have you cut costs? 
And, and yes, uh, we, we have. We have cut costs as low as we possibly can. Um, and it's not like it's suddenly just added up, added up, added up, uh, or that we're not aware of this that's happening. So we've been trying to balance cost of payroll and cost of our bills and cost of our uh, uh, different things that we're paying for within the ministries. So we have diminished our cost to the best that we can in response to what we're seeing happening within our church community. Um, why is this happening? You might be another question that you have. As I mentioned, our church has grown um, about 50, 60% smaller due to um, maybe it's changing rhythms in people's lives. Maybe it's uh, people have seen some of their perspectives shifting and, and felt like they didn't align with, with us as a church and they chose to go other places. Um, whatever it is, um, is that we are at that place where um, that reality is affecting our um, how much is, is being supported, how much is coming in. Um, and so, I, and I do want to say this, we are, we are not rebuilding living waters. They don't, don't hear me go like, oh man, we're down this much percentage. I'm really focused on that. I'm fixating on it. We got to get back up. Like, I'm not doing that. I'm not doing that. When I came back from my sabbatical after, after Jeff died, um, wasn't sure if I was even going to want to come back and do this. I'm still not sure. Um, no, sorry. Sorry. That's not funny. I apologize. <laughs> oh, okay. But I was and sincerely, Kate and I were like, do we have the capacity to come back for this? And Andy and I were talking, we we're talking about the church has shifted. There's there, a lot of people have moved on to other places and are doing different things. And it's a, it's a thing. And like, we got to do we need to get in and rebuild the church? And I was like, man, if Kate and I have to come back to a rebuilding project, we built this church. We've been here building alongside amazing leaders for the last 20, 20, let's just say 20 years. So the last 20 years, like this is, um, I'm not ready to come back and go, I want to rebuild. We're not rebuilding, but the Lord spoke to my heart and he said, I want you to regrow living waters. And so growth is not us getting in there and digging in and fixing everything and rah, 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 you got to come back and we got to do this and we got to get to certain numbers and we got to do these things. Regrowing is going back to the, for us, it was going back to those planters, those, that garden and saying, we believe that the seed and the soil and, the, and even the lattice work of, of who we are as a church is, is who God's called us to be. We not, it's not time to uproot all that and rebuild anything. It's just time to say, okay, God, Regrowing means it's at your pace with your spirit and your heart, and you're going to bring things to life. You're going to bring things back to life, um, not to rebuild. And so I believe that God is doing a regrowth work and that we are not rebuilding, but that's the reality of what is happening is that we're in a different place with numbers and numbers affect bottom lines. Now you're asking, what can we do? I think the best thing that you can do, honestly, is just give monthly. And this is my request to you. I would ask that you would give to Living Waters. If you're not giving, I'm not asking you out of any kind of compulsion or guilt. I'm just saying, hey, if what we have here is meaningful for you and it adds value to your kids' lives, it adds value to your life, it adds value to this community that we're a part of, then give into Living Waters. If it doesn't, then don't. There is no religious obligation. There is no arm twisting here. There is no God's going to be mad at you if you don't give into living waters. I know that we are in a time where you have a hundred different things that you can give your finances into that you believe in. I want you to give your finances into things that you believe in and that you are seeing impact through both to your life and to the community around you. And we believe that God has called us to be that for some of you to say, this is a place, a family, a church that I believe in and I see the impact that it's having for me, for my family, and for my community, and I want to give into that. And if we have, if we are that for you, then by all means, we need you to partner with us in resources because it makes a difference when you give, when you give regularly, when you give monthly, whatever it is. And I'm not asking for big gifts. I'm not asking you to, to go and, and, and start living on credit so that you can give to the church. In fact, if you're living on, if you're giving to us, already and you're living on credit to give, stop giving to us. If you want to be a person of generosity, steward your life in a way that you can live within the means that you have and then you can be a generous person. Generosity is not writing or giving a big gift on one day and living your life on credit on the other. 
It's what are the adjustments that God would have you make to be mature in your finances so that you can be a generous person. And sometimes that might take six months or six years, but I'm not asking you to give to us in a way that puts you in need or your kids in need, right? I'm just saying we need this. This is our reality. And if you're here and you're a part of Living Waters, then let's all partner together with the resources that we have to carry this work forward and what, what we believe that God is doing in this season and that we're in that time of recovery and we're in that time of reclaiming community and meaning and hope. So how do you give? The easiest way to give, honestly, is there's the black boxes in the back. You can always slip a check in there. You can also uh, go to lwrv.org. And from our website, so simple. You can give that way and you can set up recurring giving. Um, if you have any questions about that, I'm here. Our leadership council, if you're on the leadership council and you're here this morning, can you raise your hand just so people can see you? Raise it high. Okay, we've got two of you. Anybody else here this morning? Okay, so these two over here, you're welcome to talk to them about that. Um, if you have further questions. Um, okay, so I wanted to share that with you. <clears throat> And talk a little bit about that. Healthy families talk about finances. This is where we're at. And thankfully, we do have the, the financial ability to pull out of savings. And, hope, and thankfully, we do have the ability to move things around and, and to shift some things. And, uh, and, and so we're, we're seeing the, that we have the opportunities to make good decisions going forward. But the, the best thing that would help us the most is just for people to give and to give generously and to give regularly. <clears throat> Um, okay, so Acts 18. Let's jump in. We got time. We got time to read through Acts 18. We got time to pull out one main point, And we got time for communion to respond to what God's doing. This, is, this might be the fish and loaves with time. So you guys know that Paul's been on this missionary journey. We've been looking at his second missionary journey. In Acts uh, 16, 17, 18, uh, 19, his first missionary journey, his second missionary journey. And so this is sort of the end of his second missionary journey. And you have, if you've been reading ahead in Acts and you've been studying, I, I'm excited to see what you pull out of this, what you got out of this chapter. But I want to share with you some of the things that help with the background understanding of it. And, and as we've been doing, I'm going to read this to you and we're going to talk through it a little bit just to give context. And I'm sorry if it's not the most exciting message of all time. Um, but I find it delightful. Um, after this, Paul left Athens. He went to Corinth. Corinth. Uh, there he met a, a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla because Claudius had ordered all Jews to leave Rome. Make a note of that, circle that. So the cool thing about, about Priscilla and Aquila is that because of where they came from, from Pontius, they could have easily been early converts from, in, from Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost when Peter stood up and, and preached to all the people who had gathered from the different regions. There, are, there were thousands of people who came to know the way of Jesus in that time. And, and what's happening as we're looking at this is that we're finding people in Acts where he's bumping into people who already believe in Jesus. And why do they believe in Jesus? Because the message went out on the day of Pentecost, that empowered voice to declare the gospel of Jesus was given to the church. And, be, and so you're starting to run into people who have a relationship with Jesus. And so I find that interesting. That this, here's these folks who are like, yeah, we know the way of Jesus. And so Paul went to see them. And because he was a tent maker as they were, he stayed and worked with them. Every Sabbath, this is what Paul did. We've seen this in every chapter of Acts as part of his missionary work. Every Sabbath, he reasoned in the synagogue. We're in Acts 18, right? Am I, did I say it wrong? <laughs> What did I say? Okay, I didn't, and we're not in 19, we're in 18. Sorry, I saw the confusion. Thank you. Acts 18. Woo. I mean, we can try to get through 19 if you guys want to this morning. I'm ready. Paul went to see them because he was a tent maker as they were. He stayed and he worked with them every Sabbath. He reasoned in the synagogue, trying to persuade Jews and Greeks. And the Greeks were those who believed in God. They were converts to Judaism. They had taken the, the old covenant. They had taken circumcision and they were believers uh, in Judaism. And so he's trying to convince them that Jesus is the Messiah that they have been waiting for. 
When Silas and Timothy came from Macedonia, Paul devoted himself exclusively to preaching, testifying to the Jews that Jesus was the Messiah. But when they opposed Paul and became abusive, he shook out his clothes in protest to them. Your blood be on your own heads. I am innocent of it. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. We have to understand that Paul is giving, a, a, he is teaching a message of judgment to them based on the prophecies and the teachings of Jesus in Matthew 23 and Matthew 24. They took this very seriously and they believed that this is what part of the commission was. It was the, the message that Peter gave. How do we escape this wicked generation? He wasn't speaking to the generation specifically. Oh, every generation is wicked. Why was Peter specifically saying, you have got to repent and step out of this wicked generation because he believed that what Jesus said in Matthew 23 and 24, that these things that I'm prophesying will take place within your lifetime. And so Jesus, and then the, this generation were the people who stood before Pilate. And when Pilate said, hey, do you want me to re release Barabbas to you? Or do you want me to release Jesus to you? And they said, and he's like, this man has done nothing wrong. And they said, we want you, we want Barabbas crucify Jesus. And Pilate said, I am washing my hands of this. And the people said, may his blood be on our heads and the heads of our children. So what was Peter's message of redemption and repentance? This wicked generation who has killed Jesus and said, may, his, may we be found guilty of his blood, that these things that Jesus prophesied in Matthew 23 and Matthew 24 are coming. And so Paul knew how important this message was and he was driven to confront them and say, Jesus was the Messiah and we crucified him and they didn't believe. And so he said, I'm shaking out my garments. I am moving away from you. I am not taking responsibility for what happens. Paul's message was so emphatic, but it's tied in to the whole picture of the New Testament and of the Gospels. So he said, from now on, I will go to the Gentiles. Then Paul left the synagogue and he went next door to the house of Titius Justice, a worshiper of God. Found my spot. I almost lost it. Okay. Okay. So note this as well. Put your finger right there or circle seven. There's an interesting historical context right there is that uh, the house that he went to was literally adjoining this, the, uh, the synagogue. And so he went out of the synagogue shaking. I'm going over here. Forget about you guys. But if you, if you want to come, I'll be right here. <laughs> it's awesome. So Crispus, the synagogue leader, and his entire household believed in Jesus. They believed in the Lord. And many of the Corinthians who heard Paul believed and were baptized. So this, this uh, Crispus, it was such an important thing that they noted it in 1 Corinthians that Paul noted that he baptized him himself. Like this was a rare occasion where the synagogue leader came to know Jesus and all of his family. And so Paul baptized him. And typically Paul wasn't doing that. He was having his, the, his assistants and the people who were baptizing people. And they believe, I'm not saying they didn't believe in baptism. Ba baptism was, was vital to their message just as it's vital to our journey as disciples. But for those that understand this, baptism was a mark of, of the Passover. The Passover was we're going to mark the, mark the doors and the Passover will take place is that they're believing that coming to know Jesus and being baptized was that symbolic reality of saying my life is in Jesus and when this judgment comes Passover again will take place One night the Lord spoke to Paul in a vision, do not be afraid, keep on speaking, do not be silent for I am with you and no one is going to attack or harm you because I have many people in the city. Paul's success was stirring up the wrath of the Jews, of the religious. And Paul, he feared, probably feared being driven out of the city like he had, like we saw happening in Acts 17 over and over and over again. It was like, are we gonna have this place where I'm finding, uh, I can settle here and I can, I can preach the gospel here and I can plant churches here. Am I gonna have to move on and be chased out of this place as well? But he, but he prayed and in praying, he had a vision and God said, you do not have to fear that, stay. And so Paul stayed in Corinth for a year and a half teaching them the word of God. And while Gallio was the, the, the proconsul, which is an official ruling over the provinces uh, over when the Roman Senate was in power, 
He was the proconsul of Achaia. And the Jews of Corinth made a united attack on Paul and brought him to the place of judgment. We don't know how much longer this was after this word that Paul received from God, this vision, but he stayed there for a year and a half. And so the Jews, they, they, they brought this attack against Paul. This man they charged is persuading the people to worship God in ways that are contrary to the law, which was probably not requiring them to be circumcised and to follow the old covenant, to come into Judaism before they could become believers and followers of the Messiah. Paul was making a mess of all of that and their religious systems were falling apart and people were coming and following the way of Jesus and out of their jealousy, we noted in, in Acts 17, out of their frustration, they're always going to be after Paul. And so the religious folks are, are, are upset with Paul. Just as Paul was about to speak, he was gonna speak in defense Gallio, the, the proconsul, said this, if you Jews were making a complaint about some misdemeanor or serious crime, it would be reasonable for me to listen to you. But since it involves questions about words and names of your own law, settle the matter yourselves. He viewed the way, the followers of Jesus, he, he viewed it as a sect of Judaism. So it, was, it wasn't this new religion that the Romans had to, had to uh, make a, a, a decision on because it was already allowed under Judaism in his mind. He's like, I don't care about your dumb arguments about what part of your body is trimmed off or not. I don't want to hear about it, just like you guys probably don't want to hear about it right now. I don't want to hear about it. It involves your questions about the law. Settle the matter yourself. I will not judge such things. So he drove them off. And then the crowd, this is the, the Judaism crowd, the Jews who were so frustrated, they turned on Sothenes, the synagogue leader. So that was the next synagogue leader. And in 1 Corinthians 1.1, 1, 1, many believe that that's who's mentioned there as a, as a partner in the gospel with Jesus, I mean with Paul. And so these two synagogue leaders that Paul has led to Christ. And so they turned on this synagogue leader. Maybe he, didn't, maybe he didn't make a good enough argument. Maybe he wasn't as angry as they were. Whatever it was, they turned on their synagogue leader and they beat him right in front of the proconsul. Galileo showed no concern whatsoever. I think I just called him Galileo. He was also there, little known fact. Um, yeah, it's kind of, it's brothers, Galileo and Galileo. Um, so he showed no concern whatsoever. And so the, I need you to understand that the backdrop of this transformational community that we're looking at is social and racial unrest. Why would that take place? It, it, why did that take place? Why was that allowed to take place? Under the, the nose of the Romans that someone is being beaten is because they see this, this, this social distance. They see this difference and they're allowing these kinds of things to take place. And so the backdrop of this transformational community is social unrest and racial unrest. Do we see that happening in and around our lives today? So the news that we can take from this reality is that we as a church, that we as a people can flourish in seasons like the one that we're in. We do not have to pick a side. We don't have to join a camp, so to speak. Joshua 5, 13 through 15 is one of my favorite passages because I like, well, I have like categories, ones that make me laugh. This is one that makes me laugh. Joshua's getting ready. He's leading the Israelites. He's getting ready to lead the charge against the city of Jericho. And the commander of the Lord's army shows up. This is Joshua 5. And he's like, oh, good. Um, whose side are you on? Are you on my side? Certainly. You're the commander of the Lord's army. I'm doing God's work. You must be on my side. Are you on my side? Or are you for my enemies? In verse 14, the angel of the Lord, or the commander of the Lord's army says, neither. But as commander of the army of the Lord, I have now come. Then Joshua fell face down to the ground in reverence. And he asked him, what message does my Lord have for his servant? I believe that it is that humility that when we understand that it is not about our sides, but it is about standing before the Lord and humbling ourselves before him, that we will be able to receive a message from him that we can carry out to the world around us. Our message can't be one of the camps, one or the other, but the, or the Lord would come and say, oh, good, you're here. You must be on my side. He's like, I'm on I'm on my side. <laughs> Whose side are you on? And if we're going to say, my side, God, you need to come to my side and look like me and have the same arguments, perspective, and views as me, we might be missing an opportunity to humble ourselves, release some of those things, and lay down face first before God and receive a message that's actually transformational to the community and to the world that we're a part of. 
Paul stayed in Corinth for some time. He planted other churches. We learned this in 2 Corinthians 1. And then he left the brothers and sisters and sailed for Syria, accompanied by Priscilla and Aquila. Before he sailed, he had his hair cut off um, at Chinchreya because of a vow that he'd taken. This was most likely a Nazarite vow in response to the protection of the Lord for that year and a half that he just wanted to commemorate that God had taken care of him. And so he reached back. And this is the thing about religion. You can't, there, there's that tension point. He wasn't saying everything in religion is bad. He actually reached back in, into that Nazarite vow and said, hey, I'm gonna do that in appreciation to the Lord. So uh, it's just an interesting point of tension that Paul is finding to walk that out. He had his hair cut off as part of a vow that he had taken. Um, so they arrived in Ephesus where Paul and Priscilla left Priscilla and Aquila. He himself went into the synagogue as he always did and he reasoned with the Jews. When they asked him to spend more time with them, he declined. But as he left, he promised, I will come back if it is God's will. Then he set sail for Ephesus. Then he landed at Caesarea. He went on to Jerusalem, up to Jerusalem. He greeted the church and then went down to Antioch. That was the end of his second missionary journey. After spending some time in Antioch, Paul set out from there and traveled from place to place throughout the re region of Galatia and Phrygia, strengthening all the disciples. That's the beginning of his third missionary journey. What was Paul's goal? To create converts? No, to strengthen the disciples. His, his missions were always, they were always disciple-based. He was always trying to find and strengthen people and not just evangelistic. Of course, they were both, but he always had that heart to strengthen the church. Meanwhile, a Jew named Apollos, native of Alexandria, came to Ephesus. So Alexandria was in Egypt. It was, the, it was a part of the Roman Empire and had this uh, tradition of being very learned, very educated. Uh, and so, so Apollos came from this background and he shows up on the scene. And this might be another one, another person who was converted at a different time. And uh, he, he spoke with the Lord. Uh, he had been instructed in the way of the Lord and he spoke with great fervor and taught about Jesus accurately. Though he knew only the baptism of John, he began to speak boldly in the synagogue. And the baptism of John was John the Baptist's message of repentance, but not the baptism that Jesus promised. He began to speak boldly in the synagogue. When Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they invited him to their home and explained to him the way of God more accurately. I love this picture of Paul investing in Priscilla and Aquila and then Priscilla and Aquila turning around and investing in Apollos. The kingdom of God, the transformational work that we want to see happens at the speed and the pace of relationship. It's not all about these huge growth things. It's not always that. It's that are we investing in people around our lives in a way that makes them see, be seen and valued and built up, and that's what Priscilla and Aquila received from Paul, and then that's what they got to turn around and give to Apollos. They invited him into their home, explained to him more the way of God more adequately. When Apollos wanted to go to Achaia, back up to where Paul's second missionary journey was, the brothers and sisters encouraged him and wrote to the disciples there to welcome him. When he arrived, he was a great help to those who by grace had believed, for he vigorously refuted his Jewish opponents in public debate, proving from Scripture that, what, that Jesus was the Messiah. And so I know that you could pull probably 10, 15, 20 things out of that. If I were to ask you the question, what are we learning from this passage of scripture that informs how we are to carry and be a community of transformation? But as I ask the Lord, God, what is it that you're wanting us to see from this chapter? Give us something. Give me something fresh to speak to, to living waters. He gave me one thing, and it's in verse seven. And I mentioned it earlier, that Paul shook out his clothes. He, he he shook the dust off of me. He said, "May your, your judgment's on you. You're, I'm, not, I'm not guilty of your blood. And he went all the way next door. And what he did is he positioned himself in the home of a Gentile, of a Greek, a believer in God, but outside of the religious system, the religious synagogue, but also in a place between the religious and the culture and the Greek culture that was around them. And so because he was in the home of a Greek man, it opened up the door for converts to come out of culture. But it also opened up a door for converts to come out of religion. And the, the, the reason that that work of God blossomed in, in Corinth, in this area, is because of how Paul positioned himself within that tension. 
And so I believe that to be a community of transformation, we have to be willing to position ourselves within tension between the religious stuff of our day and the, and the culture of our day, that we wouldn't go all the way to one or all the way to the other, but that we would build a place adjacent to both that is inviting people out of those broken mindsets of both in a way that allows them to be transformed and to meet Jesus personally and powerfully for themselves. But nobody likes to exist in tension. Like when you're in tension, you're going what? Just decide one way or the other. Oftentimes, in fact, we find ourselves in tension because we're so wishy-washy that we can't make a decision. So we're like, I'm gonna try to please culture and I'm gonna try to please religion and I'm gonna end up in between these two places. We're not in tension because we're wishy-washy. We want to be in tension because we are positioning ourselves where there's going to be times when the religious people think we're incredible and there's going to be times when the religious people are not so pleased with us. And there's going to be times that culture looks at what we're doing and they're going to say, you guys are incredible. And there's going to be times when we speak truth of Jesus over their lives or to them that they're not going to be super pleased with us. And we are not going to find ourselves a community of transformation if we are in tension accidentally because we can't decide or we don't know who we are. But we will be a transformational community when we find that third way. And the third way is tension. The third way is saying, I'm okay with tension. I'm okay if not everybody on the religious side loves me in this city. I'm okay if not everybody in culture loves me in this city. But I will go and be in the middle, in the tension, so that I have a place where those who are deconstructing their faith and walking out of religion can find Jesus. And those who are deconstructing their culture and coming out of the coming out of that, can find a place to know Jesus. For us to be a transformational community, we have to be willing to stand and walk in tension. The truth is in the tension, it's often said. And I love that saying, because a lot of times when people are yelling at you to come to their camp or come to this camp, they have a picture and they have a part. But when we stay in the middle and we find that third way and we're willing to walk in tension between the camps, then we are able to offer something, I believe, offering something to both instead of becoming part of one or the other. And I can tell you stories, and I won't because we don't have time, but we have definitely frustrated people in this city. Um, and I'm okay with that tension. And I embrace that tension because I believe that tension creates growth and tension creates opportunity for us to rely fully on Jesus. It, it, it grows our faith when we live in that place of tension. Matthew 28 through 30, and I'll finish with this. This is what I referenced earlier about being a church that is centered on the heartbeat of Jesus. When we are centered on the heartbeat of Jesus, we begin to move at the rhythm of his heart. And this is the message that we offer to people, those who are caught in religion and those who are caught in the religion of culture. This is what we offer. And Jesus says this, and you know this passage of scripture, this is actually from the message because I love the way that it's written. Are you tired? Are you worn out? Do you think our culture is tired? Do you think our culture is worn out? Yeah, absolutely. Are you burned out on religion? Do you think there's people around us, around your life, in this room that are burned out on religion? Absolutely. Jesus says this, come to me. Get away with me and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do, do it. And this is the heartbeat part. He says this, learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't let anything heavy or ill-fitting be put on you. Keep company with me and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. We have to position ourselves in a place of tension where those who are weary and burdened and broken can see that we are right beside them and we are inviting them, come, this is a place of safety. This is a place of security. This is a place of renewal. This is a place of health. Come and know Jesus. And in knowing Jesus, you'll experience true and real life. Amen.
Amen. Awesome. Here's what I want to do. Um, we're going to turn on some music lightly, and I want to invite you to take communion. The communion table is open, and there's two things that I want you to take communion over. So you guys know I say this all the time. We are instructed in Scripture by Jesus, and we see it demonstrated in the New Testament church, to take communion in remembrance of Jesus, his life, his death, his resurrection, his enthronement, and the outpouring of the Spirit. So coming to communion is, is, is us coming and centering ourselves again on that heartbeat of Jesus, the unforced rhythms of grace. We get to come back to that place and be centered again on Jesus, his life, his death, his resurrection. And I believe that it's so vital to our spiritual health to do that. And sometimes what I love to do is to take a specific thing to the communion table with me. And so this morning I would ask you to do one or two of these things. One, Nisha shared with us that God is doing a renewing in our minds of anxiety and fear and that there needs to be an exchange that takes place. If that was you today and you, you know that God was inviting you to make an exchange, what better way than to do that by coming to the communion table and saying, Jesus, I make this exchange. I lay down this and this and this and I take your life and your blood and your resurrection and your enthronement and your spirit poured out and I make this exchange and that can be one. The other one is I want you to take communion over the places of tension in your life. And I believe that the Spirit of God is resting on us and is beginning to show us places where we are in tension unnecessarily and we need to release the places where we are unnecessarily finding ourselves in tension. And maybe it's because we've put ourselves too much in one camp or the other or whatever it is, but that you would release and lay down places of tension, but that you would also go to the communion table saying, Jesus, I'm willing to live in tension to bring your gospel and your truth and to be in a place where you can use me to be a beacon of your hope to our culture, but also to those who have been trapped and ensnared in religion. So here's your instructions. If you have kids over there, you're welcome to go get them. You can bring them back in and have communion as a family. We're gonna stay quiet in here. If you wanna chat and hang out and have a blast, you can do that in the lobby. We're gonna turn on some music. And if you can, and you have space in your schedule, let's take a few minutes to worship Jesus by remembering his work and inviting it as an exchange over these two areas, okay? Awesome. Thank you guys. We love you. Have a great Sunday.